This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection. Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection was released in 2016 by GMT Games and designed by Harold Buchanan. This game supports up to four players and takes from three to six hours to play. In this fifth episode of the series, we're going to cover on the solo rules for playing Liberty or Death. To understand what we're going to be talking about, you really need to have seen episodes 1 through 4 of this series. Episode 1 gives an overview for Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection. Ep episode 2 covers setting up the game. Episode 3 explains the game actions called commands and special activities. And episode 4 breaks down the winter quarters period. This fifth episode's focus is learning how to integrate non-player factions into the game to accommodate a smaller number of live players and even a solitaire experience. This will allow enthusiasts who can't find four players to get a game going or even allow players to practice strategies on their own through solitaire before joining a game of more experienced players. So, with these objectives in mind, let's get started. Let's begin with an overview of managing non-player factions. In Liberty or Death, non-player decisions are governed by a flowchart. In the game box are foldouts that list a flowchart for each game faction that governs their decisions throughout the game. These flowcharts are designed to utilize logic and priority to simulate a reasonable facsimile of human strategy. This flowchart is organized in three lanes. The first lane helps players prioritize the actions of the non-player faction. I call this the decision lane. The middle lane contains process boxes that should look more familiar to you once I give you some visual cues. The top process box in the middle lane is for managing events. The process boxes below this in the middle lane are for managing that faction's commands. Then obviously if you look in the third lane, those process boxes are for special activities. There are some additional white note boxes on the sides that fill in the gray areas for specific rules for commands and special activities. These process boxes guide players with the specific criteria and steps necessary to execute the command and, if applicable, the special activity for the non-player faction. If you're familiar with the rules for that faction's commands and special activities, these boxes guide you in administrating them on the game board. If you're fuzzy on a particular command or special activity, you can reference the rules of play or watch tutorial 3 of this series. The text in these process boxes is heavily abbreviated. To read the full text, reference pages 26 through 31 in the Rules of Play booklet. Next, we're going to walk through each of these questions to better understand how to navigate the decision lane. Let's begin navigating this British faction flowchart with the first decision diamond. The decision question is abbreviated inside the diamond, but essentially it's asking, does the current situation and the sequence of play prevent an event from being played? Or also, does the event card for the British symbol have a saber beneath it? If the answer to these questions are yes, then proceed to the next decision diamond. This would mean the British marker is in the ineligible faction space on the sequence of play chart, or they are not the first eligible faction or the second faction in play. And when they're the second faction in play, the first faction did not select command and special activity, thus blocking them from taking the event. Or this could also mean that the British flag symbol on the event card has a saber beneath it. If the answer to these questions is no, then the British faction would proceed with playing the event on the event card. This would mean that they are the first eligible faction and can choose the event, or they are the second faction in play where the first faction has chosen command and special activity, which means they could execute the event. 
and the flag symbol on the event card does not have a saber beneath it. Once in the second lane, the player will need to compare the event card text with the situation on the board and the required criteria in the process box to see if the event can be executed. If the criteria cannot be met, then simply return to the next decision diamond and solve for that question. Now while we're on the subject of event cards, let's talk about the saber and the musket icons and what they mean when they appear. There are two icons to keep watch for on event cards. The first icon is the saber. When you see a saber icon under a non-player faction flag, think of an officer drawing a saber and crying charge. This is a helpful reminder because it's exactly what you're going to do on the flow chart. When you see the saber, that faction is going to charge right past the event and work their way through the command decision points. The saber will usually appear when the event is too difficult for the solitaire mechanics to administrate. So instead the rules will have you skip over the event and continue on down the decision lane. The next icon you may encounter on event cards is the musket. The musket icon indicates that a faction can execute an event, but it requires carefully following additional rules. To remember what this icon is for, I always think of soldiers taking aim, an act that with a musket requires a lot of focus and concentration, just like these rules sometimes. In the Liberty or Death game box, there will be a foldout with random space information. Open up this foldout and inside is a list of instructions, organized by faction and card number, for completing each of these musket events. For example, our Hessian's event card that we have on display here has additional instructions for the British faction. Keep these two icons in mind as you work through the event cards and how they relate to the special rules for the musket and navigating the flow chart with the saber. Now let's look at Decision Diamond 2 to decide what to do next for the British non-player faction. The question is whether the British resources are at least one. Reference the British resource marker on the number track running along the edge of the board, and if it's at least one, then you can answer yes. By answering yes, then you proceed to decision diamond number three. If the answer is no, then the British faction moves their cylinder into the pass space on the sequence of play chart and collects the appropriate amount of resources. While we're talking about resources, let's discuss how to manage what happens when a non-player faction does not have enough resources to afford a command. The next exception to the rules is regarding funding. There is going to be times in the game when a non-player faction runs low on resources and cannot afford to execute the first command on the flowchart. When this occurs, back out to the decision lane and continue down until the next eligible command lane space opens up and can be afforded. Now let's continue on and discuss decision diamond number three. This decision requires you to look at the map and answer whether there are 10 plus regulars in play and do the rebels currently control a city but do not yet have a fort on the space. If the answer is yes, then on the flowchart, proceed to the Garrison Command process box. The process box will give you instructions for executing the Garrison Command, as well as instruct you which special activities may be used with this command. Now, if the answer is no, continue on to Decision Diamond number 4. Decision Diamond 4 asks the players to check the number of British regulars in the available forces box and roll a six-sided die. If the number of regulars in the box exceed the die result, then proceed to the Muster Command process box in lane 2. Otherwise, move down to Decision Diamond number 5. While we were discussing commands that require game pieces to be placed, moved, or removed, Let's talk about how non-player factions prioritize these actions. Let's begin with placing game pieces. When placing, a non-player faction will first place bases, which means depending on the faction, forts, or villages. Next, they will place guerrilla units like militia and war parties. Following that, 
they will alternate between placing cubes in the selected space. Beginning with the least amount of units in the space, they will alternate between regulars and continentals or tories. Next, for moving game pieces, non-player factions prioritize moving their units from unavailable to available whenever possible. And then at the game board level, they will prioritize blockades, then forts, then continentals or tories, and finally regulars. Second, when utilizing the march command, a non-player faction will always prioritize underground pieces over active pieces. Finally, for removing game pieces, it's essentially the opposite in priority to placing them. First, depending on the least number of game pieces, alternate between regulars and continentals or tories, then militia and war parties, and finally forts and villages. When a non-player faction needs to select a space, a general rule is they gravitate towards spaces with the largest concentration of force. However, there will be times when it is necessary to randomly select a space. When this occurs, take out the random spaces fold out from the box. Focus on the grid of spaces at the top of the sheet shown here. To plot the random space, a player will roll one six-sided die and one three-sided die. Remember, a three-sided die is just a six-sided die that lists numbers one through three twice. Roll the two dice and plot the coordinates on the chart. And that's your random space. But if the random space happens to be invalid for the situation, proceed down the y-axis on the chart until a space meets the required criteria. We've worked all the way down the decision lane to decision diamond 5. The question, is there a space with at least two or more active rebel pieces that are outnumbered by the total British regulars in that space plus any leader? If the answer is no, then execute the march command. If the answer is yes, then execute the battle command. Now, let's quickly recap the decision diamonds with some additional commentary. With the first decision diamond, a non-player faction, or NPF, will always prioritize an event. Decision diamond number one is all about whether this can actually happen with the current circumstances in the sequence of play chart and whether or not there's a saber icon under the faction flag on the event card. If forced into decision diamond number two, then the NPF will evaluate their resources. After all, it's hard to afford a command if you have no resources. If the NPF is currently at zero, then this is a good opportunity for them to pass and build up their resources. Decision diamond number three for the British faction other factions have slightly different priorities for their decision diamond 3, will focus on reinforcing coastal cities with a powerful garrison command potentially chained with a naval pressure special activity. Unable to accomplish this, in decision diamond number 4, they will attempt to muster if enough available regulars remain in their available forces box. Failing to meet those requirements, it's on to decision diamond number 5. If enough British cubes are in play, the MPF will then seek out opportunities to consolidate positions with a march command or with enough forces conduct a battle. Now that I've walked through the decision points for the British faction sheet, the remaining faction sheet should begin to make sense, especially since many of the decisions to be made are very similar to the British. You'll notice on the screen I've marked the decisions that more or less mirror their British counterparts. Obviously, each faction plays differently. For example, the French have a decision path based on building up their forces to play the Treaty of Alliance. No one else has that. The Indians have similar paths to the Patriots because they both have guerrilla-type units, the militia and war parties. No doubt you've noticed some of these parallels between factions while learning the commands and special activities. Once you get the hang of the playstyles and learn to read the board for each of these factions, orchestrating all of these maneuvers becomes much quicker. If anything, this can be good practice for learning how to play each of these factions.
Now, although we've covered off on some of them already, let's discuss the gameplay exceptions for playing Liberty or Death Solitaire or with non-player factions. The first exception is in regards to limited commands. For the non-player faction, limited commands in the sequence of play flowchart are always treated as full commands with special activities if available. When free commands are offered by way of an event card, treat these as a true limited command to be conducted in a maximum of one space with no special activity unless granted by the event card itself. The point here is that the rules are trying to mitigate confusion between the non-player decision chart and what is printed on the actual event card. The next exception is managing gameplay for brilliant stroke cards. Non-player factions in the game will not execute brilliant stroke cards until after the French Treaty of Alliance has been played. And if the non-player faction is the French, they will play their Brilliant Stroke immediately upon reaching the required Active Forces threshold. Next is how non-player factions manage their leaders. Leaders for non-player factions will always follow the space with the largest group of that faction's forces present. The next exception for non-player factions is the concept of the No Voluntary Removal Rule. This rule means that once all available forces are on the game board, a non-player faction cannot remove pieces and redistribute them to different spaces, like a live player in a traditional game. Now let's talk about the victory conditions needed to win the game, with one or more non-player factions involved. At the end of the last Winter Quarters round, there is a method for calculating victory based on the total numbers for the victory conditions for each faction. These totals allow the players to calculate the victory margins and determine the ranking for who won the game. For example, the Patriots will add their current total opposition number and subtract the total support number. They will then take the number of forts they have in play on the board and add 3 and then subtract the villages. The final total of the Patriot number is then compared to the other faction's total number. The British and the French are slightly different because they do not count forts and villages, that's not one of their goals, they count casualties. So for example, the British take the total support and subtract out the total opposition. They then take the total rebellion casualties and subtract the British casualties and the total of these numbers become their final total for the ranking. These four victory margin numbers are compared and then ranked from first to fourth place. This math exercise is used during a regular four-player game if no one can meet the normal victory conditions earlier in the game. However, it is primarily used in games with non-player factions. Some examples of how to use the victory margin for these scenarios are if a player is playing two factions, then that player must use the faction with the lowest victory margin to represent them. In a pure solitaire situation where it's one player versus three non-playable factions, then take the player's total and subtract it from the lowest faction's total. The gap, or margin, between those two numbers will determine the final round score. If the margin is a difference of 1 to 5, then the struggle continues. Essentially, there was no definitive victor. If the difference in the margin was 6 or greater, then that faction was successful and wins the game. Before I sign off, let's take a moment to talk about this game's playbook. In the game box, along with the rules of play, you will also find a playbook. This 52-page manual is dedicated to providing players with examples of gameplay. Examples of play for integrating non-players into a game begin on page 19. There are also plenty of examples for learning how to play a regular game of Liberty or Death. Hopefully these tutorials have gotten you better grounded in the game rules. Now you can look at this playbook and see how specific rules are administered during the game. The coin series is a very complex set of games and you'll find it necessary to refer to both of these guides on a regular basis.
At this point, you should know enough to introduce a non-player faction into a game of Liberty or Death, or even tackle a solitaire game on your own. Liberty or Death is a very advanced game and I appreciate you spending this time with me while we grapple with the rules and learn how to play. Until next time, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comment section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel.